Thanks, Steve. And thanks all of you for, for joining us today. We're going to, to have a, a panel on measurement, accountability, and innovation. And uh, as I was reflecting on the title of the panel, I uh, uncovered some of my biases against the term measurement, which sounds incredibly boring to me, and it has ever since I, I got into the, the public health sphere. And, and I, I really think we need to, to be very clear when we package measurement that it's not just about measurement for measurement's sake. It's about measuring results, measuring impact, and not stopping there. It's actually doing something about the results that you find to do better. So data that results from measurement that drives decision making is what measurement is all about. If you don't have measurement, you can't have accountability. If you don't know you're underperforming, you can't do better, and you can't fire the person who isn't doing as well as they should. And so that, to me, is the important principle underlying this discussion today. And we have a, a fantastic, very well experienced panel from the spheres of global health, global business, global media, and communications, all of whom have relevant experience to share with the global health sphere. And I would say that this is a microcosm, if you will, of how we need to be doing global health. Individuals who jealously guard global health topics because they're the experts in the field, are not going to do as well in their endeavors as those who open their minds to approaches that have been proven to be successful in other disciplines, whether that be business or any other discipline in which there is a very clear focus on doing the best that you can because people are measuring you. So in global health, measurement matters for, uh, for a few things. First of all, showing that what you're doing makes a difference. Uh, the, 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 the fields of medicine, public health, and, and science are littered with projects that began with very good intentions, but when somebody finally got around to measuring whether those things were making a difference, they found that, in fact, they weren't relative to more traditional practices, or at worst, they were actually doing harm. Secondly, measurement allows you to identify what's working and helps you to do better because you can identify lessons learned and you can take those lessons into other programs to improve their performance. Thirdly is the point about accountability. If you're going to tie somebody's compensation to performance, you have to be able to measure that performance. And this doesn't just apply to the health practitioner in a country. It applies to global institutions, such as the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria, or Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. We should be measuring all partners to determine whether they are performing as well as they should. Fourthly, in this day and age where resources are severely constrained, measurement allows you to maximize efficiency and stretch every dollar as far as you possibly can. Because if you're asking others to pony up more resource, resources for global health and you can't show that you got the most out of the resources you already have, you're going to have a much worse chance of getting any additional resources committed to your priority areas. And so demonstrating efficiency is critically important in global health. And then finally, the bottom line is that you've got to be measuring your progress if you're going to show that you're moving the dial against the Millennium Development Goals or any other goals that you have, have set for yourself. And so measurement allows us to collectively up our game and do better. Uh, before I introduce my panel, uh, let me just say that, that one anecdote from the Gates Foundation. You know, this is an organization that I'm privileged to be a part of that has access to significant resources, albeit a drop in the bucket relative to the global need, and also a certain amount of influence. Now, one can invest a million dollars into an endeavor and save X number of lives. Let's say you save a thousand lives. And you may feel very good about that, and you should feel good about that. But if you don't have a benchmark to know how well you should be doing, given that amount of money, given the influence that you have to measure yourself against, you don't know if you might be massively underperforming. And so in global health, we suffer because we don't have what business takes for granted. Business has shareholders, shareholders that have a voice. If a company is underperforming, the leader of that company hears about it, and he or she has to up their game, or they're out of a job. In business, you have competition. In global health, we don't have competition. If you are a grantee, or if you're an NGO working on the ground, if you're a donor, you really don't have anybody that you're being measured against to know whether or not you're, you're doing better or worse than they are. And so you know, the, the, the fundamental issue is that we, we actually do have shareholders. We have beneficiaries that are, that are living in, in developing countries. The problem is that they don't have a voice. 
They, don't, they can't actually influence our actions. And so we have to come up with other mechanisms to ensure that we are holding ourselves accountable. So with that, let me, let me turn to our panel to begin by, by sharing their thoughts on measurement, accountability, and innovation. Um, in a moment, I'll turn to, to Mike Merson, who's the director of the Global Health Institute at Duke. Uh, I'm not going to go through everyone's bio in detail. You have that in front of you in the interest of time. Uh, then I'll turn to Rona Applebaum, who's the vice president and chief scientific and regulatory officer at Koch. Then Pat Mitchell, who is the president and CEO of the Paley Center for Media. And finally, Rex Tillerson, who's the chairman and CEO of ExxonMobil. So Mike, let me turn to you first and have you give us a couple of minutes of, of thoughts on measurement, accountability, innovation. Uh, I think we have two real challenges, and they're addressed in the report, at least two. Uh, one, we have methodological challenges. As we, as we heard from the Deputy Secretary today, uh, the administration and, and I think our commission endorsed the, the fact that we need to measure impact of programs. That means deaths avoided, yeah. new infections avoided. Um, it's not simply measuring um, how many people have a bed net or how many health workers have been trained or how many people have been treated, but showing impact. And I think this is something we, you've already addressed, and I think it's very important that we work together to come up with a, with a set of indicators and ways of measuring them that demonstrate this impact. And then our second challenge, I would say, and it's related, is an operational challenge. We, the Commission heard some presentations about what it's like to be in the field having to um, produce data for different donors. And uh, certainly the situation is a little bit better than it was maybe five years ago when PEPFAR has worked to harmonize with other donors, but I think the Commission certainly felt that to all extent possible, the donors need to come up with a similar set of agreed upon monitoring and, evalu and in monitoring and evaluation indicators for measuring the impact of programs that are agreed to with national governments and, and that everybody stick with these uh, and not, add a f not everybody add a few others uh, because as we continue to do that, we make it impossible in the field and we heard testimony to that uh, in, in the work of the Commission. So you'll see in the report we, we call for addressing both these methodological and what I would call operational challenges. And the third point I would make is, um, which has been alluded to already today, which is um, if we can have, I think Steve Morrison mentioned this, if we can have a, a 10 or 15 year horizon rather than a, a five year or God forbid a one year horizon, uh, then I, I think would, we can be more patient, we can plan better, and then we can look at our evaluation not producing results for tomorrow, but re producing results over a longer period of time. And if we have the confidence of the funding and the, and the confidence that our programs will be around for a while, as long as we can demonstrate impact, I think this would go a long way to advancing the field. And I know that many of you are getting money year by year, and we did talk about this at the Commission, and certainly you'll see in the report the strong recommendation that those of you out in the field implementing programs not be faced with these year-by-year -year, uh, deadlines uh, because it's very hard to show impact on a yearly basis. Uh, but but I, I think we need to be accountable uh, to a common set of indicators, but it doesn't mean we need to ex expect in reality, particularly with the problems we're dealing with, that we can achieve great success in one year. I think those are some initial thoughts. Great. Thanks, Mike. Let me turn to Rona. First, I'd like to say I agree with a lot of the things, many of the things, if not all of the things that have been said. Um, the issue with process is absolutely key um, from the beginning and to the end. And what I mean by that, it's absolutely essential to identify where you are and where you want to be and make it very clear to the point that's already been made that it's not going to be a quick fix. And in our society, everything, at least uh, especially in the business world, it's, it's, you know, what is the next quarter results? They have a tendency to judge things on a three-month basis. Um, we, we can't do that. In global health, it's a long term. Uh, we have to be in it for the long term, and we have to plan accordingly. At the same time, we have to also identify where those, you know, what the deliverables are and attempt to meet those outcomes. One of the points that uh, ma was made very clear to me, and I was, uh, I was shocked, to be perfectly honest, as it relates to the burden that's placed upon those organizations, those individuals that are trying to do the best job that they can 
but they're impacted, their in efficiencies and their effectiveness is impacted by the burden of reporting. Um, it is so outrageous. Please see page 38 of the report where you see the spaghetti chart. And that's a nice term for it. When I, when I was listening to the, to the you know, impassioned pleas, make it easier so we can do our job, it was just absolutely um, spellbinding for me. So I applaud the report and I applaud the experts um, who are, are making it very clear that we have to reduce that burden, um, we have to streamline it, we have to make sure that it's, it's, it's more efficient in order to get the job done that we need to do. There's a lot of, uh, I, I'm so pleased to hear um, the commentary this afternoon as it relates to we all have a role to play. We can all learn from each other. And the idea of the embracing that I've felt and I've heard as it relates to the importance of public-private partnerships are absolutely essential. For a company like ours that's in over 200 countries, we can't do it alone. There's information that we have, there's lessons that we have learned that we would like to share. Um, the outreach and the, and the fellowship that we can glean and align and, and interconnect with in order to make things better for our workforce out there, um, for our employees, for our consumers, and above all, for ourselves would be absolutely essential. The things that we do in business are not strange. The applications that can be applied to what we need to do in the global health community are, are absolutely aligned. And to be able to do that more and more, uh, share our experiences, and in some instances, share our resources, uh, we would very much like to do, and it's been a, a true pleasure in terms of being able and an honor to be able to apply those types of lessons to this report, so thank you. Thank you, Rona. It's so um, valuable for a global health discussion to be informed by perspectives from the private sector and now from, from media and communication. So Pat, let me turn to you. Well, certainly there's no tool for transparency, accountability, effectiveness and reporting of impact than global media. Um, and as someone who's been in the field for some time and now leading a discussion on the role that global media plays across the landscape, let me just offer some thoughts. Um, one of them oh, yeah. is that we know we will never live in a time of greater connectivity. We've never been more informed as citizens of the global community. We've never been more informed trying to address global health challenges. So we have it at our disposal an enormous landscape of technology and media that wasn't there before, that can shine the light in dark places, that can tell the stories, okay, not too that not only illuminate the challenges, but also talk very clearly and directly about the programs that are in place, hold okay. them accountable for their results, and then also connect American U.S. taxpayers to the stories that they are actually <laughs> funding in the field. The good news uh, on this is the connectivity. Additional good news and emerging news okay. um, is that new Alrighty. technologies are giving us new tools in the field. There's some small-scale experiments that are turning out to be quite effective um, through mobile technology in places where women, particularly during childbirth and pregnancy, isolated and often illiterate women, okay. are getting life-saving information through mobile phones. We know okay. that we, wander over. we also know okay. there's new open source software that allows what uh, caused you to get so interested in doing this kind of work? to get to disaster areas and deliver very pinpointed aid where it's needed. So we see a huge opportunity in the global media landscape to deploy these new technologies what, what's the word? at a much greater rate and with much greater effect. Well, whatever that may mean. <laughs> the bad news is that according to the Global Media Monitoring Where? Report that's done every two years, of news and information sources across all countries oh, and Prince across George, all oh, sure. forms of media, from new social media, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, to the mainstream news reporting uh, in newspapers, magazines, and on television. Less than 10% of these stories are about global health. Now, of course, there are the spikes when there's a disaster, when there's an earthquake or 
or when there's an epidemic or a threat of a pandemic. But so it really came from where you grew up and what you saw and how you reacted to it. challenged to find the ways to use this enormous power. How come Elaine's not in there? Doesn't the she want to see her own company? To bring it to bear in ways that will increase awareness uh -huh. and therefore increase now, effectiveness. You want so this. that's where you and I come in. Yeah, here you are. Let me just find demand it. That here you go. Global media pay more attention to okay. On Good. A more consistent basis. Yeah, real quick, because I've got to really get going to the shuttle. Professionals okay. Professionals working in the media have a, the challenge, along with the health professionals, professionals, to find a way to tell the stories that are compelling and engaging and that capture well, someone let us the in. world's attention. We've heard today already personal stories that oh, tell yeah. the whole story. The one woman Wherever. story who dies in childbirth every minute around uh, the world somewhere. We know empathy research tells us we have to tell those stories that way. Yeah. One child, one woman. It's so much more effective, and media is learning uh, to do this now. And I must say that the Gates Foundation has found a way to do that very effectively with their living proof testimony that took the effect of their global health programs and told them through the personal stories. So that is, again, an opportunity. So the good news is we have new ways of telling the stories. The bad news is they're not being told effectively and consistently enough. Um, but I am, as, uh, as Bill Gates would say, an optimist based on the opportunities we have a ahead, but a little bit impatient with my colleagues in media not, not, by not recognizing and fully deploying uh, media as a power player in both putting into place and supporting a smarter and more strategic global health policy. Thank you, Pat. Um, let me now turn to, to Rex Tillerson from ExxonMobil. Rex, you've uh, gotten involved in the global health sphere in a big way. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, as a, as a business person, uh, measuring and evaluating is central to any achievement of really large long-term objectives. Uh, for us, our business is pretty long-term in the things I do. We deal with 10, 20-year time horizons. And so I think part of the real uh, important element of this report is, and has been noted by Mike, is that we now want to focus on these issues with a longer-term strategy in mind, a 15-year time horizon. And we know what the objectives are, and we know what the results we're trying to achieve are. We want to eradicate malaria. Uh, we want to reduce the incident of HIV AIDS uh, by two-thirds. We want to save two million women a year from dying in pregnancy. We want to save almost two and a half million babies a year from dying in the first month of childbirth. So we know what the end point is, but in achieving a strategic plan, you have to have a good set of metrics that will allow you to understand whether you are progressing toward achieving those objectives over this 15-year period. They're going to guide and direct uh, the programs that you undertake, the effectiveness of those, and how to improve the effectiveness of those programs. But equally important, they're also going to guide you on what you want to stop doing because there will be things that work, there will be things that don't work, and to continue pursuing things that are not taking you toward that objective are consuming both financial resources and human capacity resources as well. So measuring and evaluating is central to achieving any of these long-term objectives. And Mike mentioned, and the, spag the uh, spaghetti chart has been mentioned, I think the first time I saw that in one of our commission meetings may have been when Bob Rubin, who just joined us, held that chart up, and we were all kind of horrified by this, uh, by this requirement that donor nations and donor agencies were putting on uh, host government recipients. Chart. And we said, well, gee, that just, that just can't be right. A lot of those are measuring inputs. They're not really measuring what you're trying to achieve. And a lot of them are designed to meet the donor's requirements, not carrying us toward the objective. So I think one of the, uh, that was one of the, uh, a great learning for me was to see how, the, how could this possibly be coming from the business community. Uh, the importance of evaluation really cannot be overemphasized. And, and I've, there was a recent article in The Lancet, which I thought just really nailed this. The, the title was Evaluation, the Top Priority for Global Health. And I'm just going to quote a couple of lines out of it. Evaluation must now become the top priority in global health. A massive scale-up in global health investments during the past decade has not been matched 
by an equal commitment to evaluation. This complacency is damaging the entire global health movement. Without proper monitoring and accountability, countries, donors, and taxpayers have no idea whether or how their investments are working. Evaluation matters, evaluation is science, and evaluation costs money. It's time that the global health community embraced rather than eva evaded this message. So it is going to require some dedication of financial and human resources in this area, but it is going to return huge dividends in the effectiveness of how the remaining dollars in human resources are utilized to achieve the ob objective. Now, in the Commission's report, there is a, a recommendation around getting at some very hard, fundamental results-oriented measures, an agreement on metrics. Uh, coming to a common set of metrics, as Mike uh, uh, mentioned as well, but also a recommendation that, that an independent authoritative group be established to develop the evaluation process and to carry out that evaluation process. It could be within an existing agency. It can build on some of the measures that are already in place, uh, some progress that has been made through PEPFAR. But let's establish what those set of metrics are. Let's have an independent body track those and report out those to donor countries, but to the Congress. The people who are going to make this money available are going to want to know what are we getting. And there can never be a more important time now when you want to have this funding available in good times and in bad times, in challenging times, you want this funding to be maintained uninterrupted because an, interrupt in, an interruption in the funding or financing you lose a lot of ground. You give a lot of ground back on progress that's been made in so many of these areas when you have this interruption. Well, these metrics are going to be vital to ensuring that the long-term financing is available to achieve this 15-year plan. Thanks, Rex. That was fantastic. Um, I think we have, uh, we have a little bit of, uh, of time uh, left, uh, according to more <laughs> recent information I just got. Um, I, I don't know that I'll be able to ask all the panel members uh, questions individually, but I want to get through as many as, as possible. Rona, when in global health, particularly in the vaccine sphere, we always talk about how Coke has been able to reach places that nobody else can. And you talk about 200 countries that, that Coca-Cola is in. That's just astounding to me. You know, th there are some, some challenges in global health that I think would really benefit from the lessons learned of your experience. And specifically, aside from the cold chain example that I, I just referenced, where you actually have refrigeration capability, presumably, that, that goes all the way out to very peripheral regions. Let's we have try, other challenges that relate to maintaining so quality of health services and quality of the commodities like food. Now, okay. uh, Tell me what time oftentimes we have to rely on, on local partners to main, ensure that quality. What, what lessons have you learned about working with local partners, working in country to ensure a certain minimum, but very high, actually, uh, level of quality in both services and commodities? It's a great question. They took my Blackberry away. Where's that nice man? And to start off with, you know, just to be perfectly clear, the standards for whether it's our safety or our quality of our nice, product. The nice man who um, gave me this thing took my BlackBerry Whether away. it's in the United States or whether it's in India or yeah, whether it's well, in South Africa or Nairobi. So, um, um, but one of the things that is, is that we've learned no, as a company Shaheen over the last 20 or 23 later, years is it's not necessarily going to be um, then we could start. dictated start. and done by Atlanta. Then what time? Um, we will uh, think globally, but we'll act locally. And, and doing what we need to do in country do is absolutely essential. Over 85% of our workforce is outside of the United States. So what does that take? That takes the necessary time um, needed to map what those processes are, needed to map what the, what the critical um, requirements are and the resources are. But it's the investment in those local individuals, because they are the community, they are our business there, that's absolutely essential. What are the capacity, what, what's the capabilities that we need, the competencies that we need? And, and, the, and the capacity of the workforce that we have to have in country that's going to make the difference, to make sure they're adequately trained, they're adequately uh, uh, enforced in terms of, of making decisions, that they have the necessary tools and we have the necessary infrastructure. And it doesn't always have to be the Cadillac. Um, as you know, being in the producing countries, um, when I was in the cocoa industry, We'd get Coke anywhere, Fanta, it was great. You know, we'd drink coffee in the morning, in the afternoon until five o'clock when we could have beer, we'd have Fanta and we'd have, have Coca-Cola because it was a safe product. But it wasn't as, as if they always had trucks 
to bring it there. They would use their bicycles, they would use a boat, they would use a mule, they would use whatever they could. Again, realizing that this was a shelf-stable product and not perhaps as sensitive as some of the, the, uh, the vaccines, but at the same time, as you increase your innovation, you then get refrigerated units that can still be on the back of a bike, on the back of a mule, or in your boat when you're taking it down, when you're taking it down one of the rivers. So, you know, to that point, it's been, uh, you know, we didn't, we, we aren't where we are. Uh, it didn't happen immediately. It happened over a 123 year period. So it wasn't done overnight. But, but this is an opportunity in terms of sharing those best practices and those lessons learned uh, with the global health community to make a difference. Because when the global health is the best it can be, where we operate, it's gonna be better for our business. We're gonna have a healthier, sustainable business because the workforces that we need, we rely upon, that make Coca-Cola what it is, is dependent upon global health. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to work together, um, share experiences, share learnings, um, and, and, and it's the only way that it's gonna get done. That's great, thanks. Um, Pat, one of the, uh, one of the Issues around accountability, we, we talked about measurement here and measuring uh, uh, an individual or an institution's performance from a top-down command and control perspective is one way to ensure that you maximize performance. Uh, another way to improve performance of actors in the system is to increase demand, particularly demand amongst the public. If individuals who uh, are of little means become aware that there are options to get quality, affordable health services, then they will begin to demand that from the public sector and the private sector. Being in media communications, you're all about informing individuals about the art of the possible. What do you see as the potential role for media and communications in increasing demand and ultimately increasing accountability? I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I always like to, it's so easy to blame media and to say media never covers the stories that are important. And honestly, media is not very good, as we all know, at covering anything complicated or complex. I mean, we're just, you know, got to find a simple way to tell the story. But, me, you know, there's a media organization, but there's also a consumer. And what has changed in global media now is the power has shifted. The power has shifted from the people in top-down mainstream media making decisions about what gets covered, what stories are reported, to coming up from the grassroots consumers, people with cell phones and who are blogging and in social communities and uh, on Twitter, they are themselves delivering a different kind of demand that information be shared. And you see in, in communities, and I was in a remote village in, uh, in Kenya not long ago, and, and the one person who had the mobile phone in the village, and there was one, and it happened to be a woman, uh, and she was going around saying, did you know that that clinic is, she was passing out the information and then putting a demand and an expectation of the health clinic that was there, that they do in fact deliver what she had found out through her mobile phone uh, was possible. So it creates a different kind of accountability. But it also gives all of us uh, as media consumers a way to realize we have that power too now. It's in our hands. And I think the, the steps that we began to talk about at the commission is how we take something as wide ranging and as long term as this and start to find some strategies where we can build social media communities uh, around the demand and most importantly for our conversation today, uh, helping make those connections to US taxpayers who are funding and who are now being asked to step up their funding. You know, what's happening? And we know that we can get those reports directly from the ground. That's new. That's powerful. Let me uh, let me turn to um, my partners here and see how we're doing on time. Okay. okay. Wrap up. Okay. Um, great, Mike. A uh, couple of references uh, have been made to the uh, the spaghetti chart. So this uh, this Byzantine system of reporting to multiple different different uh, donors. You know, we have made a strong pitch here uh, around the importance of measuring results and accountability, but if we're having this conversation uh, in an attempt to influence how the U.S. government uh, manages its investments, and the same dialogue 
is happening in capitals around the country where bilaterals are deciding how to spend their funds, we may not be solving any problems here. We may actually be creating additional bureaucracy and, and, and not, in fact, doing what we intended to do. You've thought a lot about this, I know, at, at the WHO and since. Can you, do you have any initial thoughts on how we can, how we can streamline and actually make this a value added? It's a tough question because many of the bilaterals are beholden to their parliaments or, or legislatures to account for the funding. And um, like we have seen in this country, sometimes the Congress has certain preferences for use of our money and then the Congress changes and the different party takes over and those preferences change and the poor countries have to figure all that out. So this is a very tough issue. Um, what I, where I think there's a, a growing consensus and the question I think is whether the U.S., when we heard from the Deputy Secretary, if, if the U.S. really wants to invest diplomatically in, in a common set of reporting indicators, uh, it'll make a huge difference. But that's, that's got you know, to come down to the ambassadors, and it, it's got to be real. And the, many of the organizations in this room which receive resources from PEPFAR or the New Global Health Initiative, whatever it is, they have to know that, um, they have to believe that uh, this is really going to happen. I, I don't know any way around it. It hasn't, it's better, uh, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, the UN agencies are also part of this. We have these new look at the Millennium Development Goals, which uh, the current Millennium Development Goals go until 2015. I think you know that there's now a beginning effort by the Secretary General of a dialogue to talk about what the next set of uh, these Millennium Development Goals will be. This is a good time for the, the donor community to step back and say, okay, um, are we serious? Are we going to try to come up with a common set? We tried uh, indicators. You know, in HIV, there was this uh, three ones. But you'd go to the field, and there would be the three ones. And, 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 and then you know, you'd, get, you'd get countries reporting on this common set of indicators. And then the US wanted a little bit more, and the UK wanted a little bit more. And it turned out, yeah, there was a common set of indicators. But then everybody had their add-ons. So the question to my, in my mind is, is truthfully whether the US wants to invest diplomatically to make this happen. I, I don't know a way around it. Um, the, the U.S. has uh, the most money invested in this field, and if they are willing to throw their weight around and make it happen, it can happen. Um, there's going to need to also be development of new methods and metrics to, to measure some of these impact indicators. It's not going to be that easy. It's, it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's easier to measure a process indicator, or as Rex said, an input, than, in, than to really look at impact. But I think if we, if, we, if we get groups together around the table from different constituencies uh, and get serious about it, hopefully the spaghetti chart, uh, you know, it'll be reduced to macaroni maybe, but I, I, I think we need to have some, some commitment to make it happen. And it'll be the first, it'll be historic if it does, uh, but it would be a great contribution of the Global Health Initiative. All right, thanks, Mike. I'm gonna uh, turn to Rex uh, for my last question, and, and that is, um, we, you know, Rex, we, t we talked briefly about the fact that institutions in global health don't have the traditional me measures of accountability that, say, a business would. Um, you've managed a, a huge corporation. Um, what are the other principles, strategies, tactics that you would suggest to leaders of global health organizations that they should consider bringing into their operations in order to increase a level of accountability uh, throughout the, the enterprise? Well, I think you have to engage all of the interested parties from as I mentioned, from the U.S. government to multilateral agencies to other donor agencies, but you also have to engage the recipient of the, you know, the, the recipient country. And a lot of these measures can best be defined by engaging with where the rubber meets the road. You know, what is it that we're looking for inside those countries where this effort is directed that will tell us whether we're being effective? So to develop this really does require a great deal of collaboration uh, from the donor agency or a country all the way down to the recipient. And it's going to require some capacity building within these countries for them to be able to provide those, you know, respond to those metrics that we're asking for. And we were having a conversation the other day about malaria, which we're very interested in, and how we, we can tell you how many bed nets 
were distributed every year, but we can't tell you how many children between the age of birth and five years are infected with the parasite. They may not have malaria, but they've got the parasite. Well, we'd really like to know that because that tells us whether we're beating the parasite in terms of infection rates and in terms of vector transmission. But it means we've got to build some capacity for that to occur, for that to be measured. It means we've got to build it into an integrated health system so that when a mother brings her child in for some other reason, nothing to do with malaria, well, we've got them there. We draw a little blood. We do a, a malaria test. We got it. It's in the database. So we need to integrate it with a lot of the other health programs that deal with mothers and children and a lot of this, this infant care that we've talked about. But it does involve a great deal of collaboration, and that's the way we do it in the business community. We work down throughout our organizations, and when we enter developing countries with our own business model, okay. we're putting in place metrics for our business partners that are in those countries as well. So we do a lot of training, a lot of conversation around here's why we're measuring this, here's why it's important. And in terms of unraveling the spaghetti chart, it is going to be a, a huge challenge, but I think the central question everyone has to ask themselves for their piece of information on that spaghetti chart is, you tell me what that tells you about eradicating malaria, and then I'll tell you whether you can have that information or not. And if you cannot directly connect that to the result, you don't need that information. It's going to take that kind of discipline, and that's what we have to do in the private sector is have the discipline to say, no, we're not going to gather that information because it doesn't really take us to our objective. And you have to have, get that same mentality, I think, within this process as well. And so tough, Mike, but it means some, we're going to have to have some tough leadership the United States is putting a lot of money out there in this game. They need to change the paradigm and lead, and I think some other people will follow. Thanks for that, for that, Rex. I think, uh, I think we, we've heard some, some, some great messages and, and guidance from our, our panel today. Uh, you know, I told you at the beginning that I, there was a time when I thought measurement was pretty boring. Uh, it, measurement itself is, frankly, a little bit boring, but, but the reality is that it's really, it's really, really, <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to say it. It's, 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 it's really, really important because if you're not measuring, if you're not measuring, you don't know that you're having an impact. And I think that point has been highlighted uh, in, in some way, shape, or form by, by every individual on the, on the panel today. It's the critical element that allows all of us, forces all of us to up our game. So I hope you all leave today convinced of that fact. Thanks very much to my panel members.